Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching this in-depth ag forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. Well, I want to start off with just a quick view of what's going on over in parts of Western Russia and Ukraine. I want to show you some satellite imagery to begin with. Just thinking about the weather uh, impacts right now in this particular area, I just wanted to show you, go back to uh, the day after Valentine's Day, and we can see the extent of the snow line here across northern Ukraine. And what we've seen since then, there's been quite a few cloudy days in here, but if I get out here to one of the more kind of clear days on like February 20th, we saw a lot of that snow uh, kind of retreating a bit farther to the north. And if you look out here on the 21st, very similar story. In fact, as you get out here to the 23rd yesterday, we can see a lot of that snow has cleared out. And the point behind showing this is that the forecast for this particular area over the next uh, 10 days or so is quite mild. So you see that much of Russia, uh, especially right in here in the Russian wheat belt and then getting into Ukraine, uh, sorry, does have a warmer uh, bias overall as we press forward into this forecast. It's interesting just to note where the coldest air is in North America. Much of it is here over Greenland. It's here over the Canadian prairie. It's into uh, you know the Canadian Maritimes. And at times, we've seen some pretty major cold air outbreaks that have run through the midsection of the United States. So it's, it's really certainly sitting on one side of the hemisphere. Now, uh, in addition to that, I would just like to focus in and look at precipitation compared to normal over the next 10 days. And uh, here's the Black Sea, so you can see where Ukraine is. We do have above average precipitation forecast for the southern part of the Russian wheat belt, but overall, Ukraine is gonna be relatively dry. So no major weather factors kind of at play right now in this part of the world. So I just thought it would be good to bring you up to speed on what was going on there. Now, over the last seven days here in the United States, we have been hit repeatedly in this area with extremely heavy rain. So parts of the Mid-South, Tennessee Valley, Ohio Valley, some places in here have picked up in excess of six inches of rainfall. And the models actually did a very good job at honing in on that uh, potential region. Of course, we saw the snow here earlier in the week, but there's a large area that's missed out on this, and a lot of that's right here in the Central Plains. Now, I'm going to get to what's changing in the West in just a few moments, but I'd like to come back to this drought area because, as I've been showing you since the beginning of the year, there's a large section here of the Western Corn Belt stretching from Wisconsin through Iowa into Nebraska, part of South Dakota, that's very, very dry, and that extends south into the Southern Plains. Uh, as well. In fact, there are two climate reporting districts in Nebraska right now that are reporting their driest start uh, on record to a new year. And these records go back to 1893. The same is true for the West. So we have a couple of bigger questions to be asking in this video at the beginning. Is there any uh, possibility of getting a pattern change that could significantly impact these drought regions as we move now into the month of March? Now, I'm going to show you the latest drought monitor. This is what we've got. February 24th, it was just released today, and it shows us that about 73% of the country is in some stage of drought. And let's look at it a couple different ways. We always like to go look at the change maps. Let's just see how much this has changed over the last week. So notice we've seen some improvement in parts of Texas, Oklahoma, and Arkansas. Same thing for this part of Illinois. But there's been some places in here where either it's not changed or it's gotten worse. And just take a look down here along the Gulf Coast and the, and the Southeast Coast of the United States. We do have pockets in there that are continuing to show up dry. It's easier to see when you look out over the last couple of months, or maybe even out over the last three months, uh, kind of the extent of that drought and where it's been expanding. Now, just coming back to the main map, I got asked a great question yesterday. I thought we'd just address it in this video. Um, how's all this compare, whoops, sorry. How's all this compare to 2012? Because the person who asked me heard me mention in the previous video that this is the greatest aerial extent of drought area in the United States since uh, you know July and August of 2012. So I thought we'd just do that real quick. So if we take a look at this, um, this is what the drought monitor looked like on February 28th, 2012. So much different scenario. We saw a lot of dry air that had already been in place over parts of the southeast, including Florida. And the 2011 drought that was here was expanding at this point, hitting much of the southern plains very hard. The extent of the drought in the west was much less. Same thing uh, for parts of, of like Montana into Wyoming. This was just an entirely different setup. And just thinking about some of the bigger differences uh, from 2012 to now, I'd also like to show you ocean temperatures from then. So just to make a point, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation going into 2012 was very, very negative. A lot of cold water in the Gulf of Alaska, very cold water extending off the Baja of California, and it trekked out here into the fading La Nina that was really centered over Nina Region 3.4 into the Pacific. We also saw cold water that extended back toward Japan. So that's a very, very strong signal in the Pacific for risk of drought in the Midwestern part of the United States. So this is, this is the pattern we always look out for. Plus, we were developing an El Nino at this particular point. So this was February 24th, 2012, and I'd just like to show you this year. So there are considerable differences. While there is still a negative PDO signal, 
it is nothing compared to what it was at this time in 2012. Uh, we are watching a La Nina fade, but this one, as we've discussed, is more east focused. So we start to look at these differences and piece them together as um, just, to, just to make sure that folks know that despite the fact that 73% of the country is covered in drought at this point, at least some, some level of drought, that the longer term risks for going into one of those summers that just hammers the midsection of the country with drought um, is um, it's not the same picture that was painted back in 2012. I just want to make that statement because that was what the question was. Now, what do we have going forward? Well, we see right now that the MJO is denoted by these uh, velocity potentials, which in the green and blue here tell us that the MJO is going to probably spend a lot of time, you know, here north of Australia over phases possibly four, five, and six. That, um, that's likely because we've got this little kick in the trade winds. The trade winds have a little bit extra push right now. And historically, while this is kind of a rare configuration, it does, as we've talked about so many times in my recent videos, allow for the atmosphere to um, relax away from the big ridges along the west coast and possibly be more reinforced with troughing in that area. So that ends up setting up the west coast, setting up the midwest, uh, and, and, and the northeast for pretty active weather because it's all got to run over a ridge that would be in this particular area. Now what's not accounted for very well here is the potential for any upstream blocking that we could have in the North Atlantic. In fact, there's very few cases of phase five during a La Nina at this particular time period. But sh should it go over into this particular setup, this would be important for the longer range forecast. Now, just thinking about all of this, let's go straight to the European model's brand new update for the month of March. And the biggest changes were here, okay? The newest runs are now allowing for, well, let's go take a look at it real quick. Let's go to the upper level heights. I'm gonna click on the seven day anomalies and let's blow this out to a Northern hemisphere view. There we go. The newest changes, here we go, are such that once we get to the middle of March, the models are finally really showing a strong signal of taking that ridge here. And that generally just opens up to a bit more zonal flow that opens up to more troughs coming into the west through the Canadian prairie into the Midwest. They're tending to run over some sense of a ridge over the southeast. And you can see as we play this out, that, that seems to be the overall flow pattern uh, with the strongest temperature contrast in the northern hemisphere setting up the, the, the main kind of flow right into this region. So we think about all that. Let's go back to a North American view and look at that 30 day pattern. We see a couple of important things here. This area stays very active. The drier bias that's in the southern plains will likely not extend quite as far to the east as we suggest. In fact, I would encompass this entire area as possibly being active. And I'll also say this, the models are probably too dry for northern California. I think what we end up seeing here is better flow, onshore flow into the west if this pattern opens up the way that it's currently looking to open up. And why I think this is all important is that we need to work hard on, on eliminating drought from California to the Southern Plains, because you know that all those seasonal models are out there still predicting that this is going to be a major issue as we you know, move forward. Now, one of the big factors with all of this, as I just kind of flipped over to it, is that the PDO, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, which is that uh, cold water, let's go take a look at it, this cold water right in through here, still shows a, a pretty strong signal of helping that ridge go this direction. So when I'm looking at all these different teleconnections saying, do they add up, do they constructively interfere, or they deconstructively interfere, I'm seeing better supporting evidence of a pattern like this. So we just come back to it again. This seems to be the setup going into the month of March. Unfortunately, this means more flooding for places that are already soaked, but it could mean better moisture return to parts of the Midwest that need it. What'll be the wild card will be this area right in through here. And do we get those troughs deep enough to cut farther south into California? There are some indications that that will. There's multi-model support with this as well. What I'm showing you next is the CFSV2. This is their outlook for the week of the 10th through the 16th for precipitation compared to normal, this being above average, okay? And then this would be the week four. This would be the 17th of March to the 23rd. And again, do you see how the CFSV2 is also returning better moisture to the West Coast, but keeping this area extremely active. There are major areas in which this def these deficits need to improve. There's time before spring, but we need to be watching it carefully, okay? 
What I'd like to do next is I'd like to come into the current system because I was watching some lightning strikes all day today in this ice storm that's kind of uh, kind of emerged into this area, overrunning setup right into this region. We saw some lightning right here in parts of Kentucky just recently. Now, I just thought you might like to see this. Where I live in Illinois, we've had some huge snowflakes come through. I took a quick time-lapse video of my neighbor's house <laughs> just showing you what some of those, uh, or not time-lapse, excuse me, slow motion video, some of these uh, massive snowflakes, big aggregates falling earlier in the day. Just impressive to see that. But where this is all going, I think, is captured well in the all-hazards uh, map. We can see here that we still have winter storm warnings out for this area through late this afternoon, but these are going to be going away pretty quickly. Winter weather advisories connect that up to where the heavier snow is going to be here in uh, parts of the northeast. Flood watches along this area, and we still have a freeze warning in the Central Valley of California. But these wind chill warnings we've seen here, they're going to go away. I, I'll be interested for you to see these temperatures I'm about to share with you in a few moments. But first, I would like to talk about the ice potential we still are dealing with, because you notice that through Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, late today, and then really in the overnight hours and tomorrow, this part of um, Pennsylvania, potential for picking up ice uh, in, in a broad area here, heavily populated region as well. So this is, this is a concern. And if we look at the high-res NAM model, the 18Z run today, we can kind of see the timing of this. So through this evening, getting into the overnight hours, and then into early tomorrow morning, you see that that's the area I'm going to watch carefully. There's certainly snow on the back side of this. Thankfully, these winds are not nearly as strong as they had been in the northern plains uh, earlier this week and last week. But this is going to spread some snow into New England. Now, after that pulls on out, so this is 5 p.m. tomorrow on Friday, high pressure dominates the midsection of the United States. And other than some kind of return flow button up against the front down here, there's just some showers down south. And other than that, we're going to turn most of our attention to the west coast for the next probably seven or eight days. To do that, I'd like to go to the multi-model analysis. Whoops, go backward there. This would be the GFS on the left and the European on the right. These are the 12Z runs. So we've already seen this system, okay? Pulls into New England. This is now early in the morning on Saturday. High pressure's in control. You can see the scattered showers right here to the south on Sunday morning, Saturday night and Sunday morning. And then that even exits, okay? The Europeans, the latest to let that, uh, that next front kind of move on out. But after that, there's going to be three separate coastal lows that go into the Pacific Northwest over this weekend into Tuesday and Wednesday. A couple of clippers roll out of the plain, or excuse me, out of the Canadian prairie. But these systems coming into the west are delivering moisture to places that desperately need it, as we saw earlier. So even out by the end of this week, a big section of the country is going to be drier, but it's that Pacific Northwest into Northern California. Look at what the European models are doing. Very aggressive with this, returning moisture all the way out there through the 3rd and 4th of March. Now, to see how much snow we're going to get out of this, let's just go take a look at it. The first system right here has the potential, uh, you know, getting into tonight and tomorrow to put down anywhere between two and some places over 10 inches of snow in parts of New England. Now, after that, we're not adding much anywhere. There's the clippers coming through the Canadian prairie. But notice the west. I'll just keep playing this out. You see that the western United States, in the presence of those deeper troughs, starts to build snowpack back again. And that's absolutely critical. We have a, a clipper track right here. See it? But the western snows are what I want to continue to see. On the total precipitation side of this, we saw this already today. Okay, so that's what's going through parts of the Mid-South today. You see, if I kind of rock back and forth watching this area, that is the weekend rains coming out of eastern Texas, spreading into northern Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, and Tennessee. And Tennessee doesn't need another drop of rainfall. But after that point, you're going to see most of the additions happening in the west. So you see that parts of coastal Oregon could pick up, Oregon and Washington could pick up anywhere between two and five inches of rainfall. We're going to be bringing rain into the Columbia Basin. And if you notice, I just played all the way out better moisture coming even into the Sierra Nevada. Now the action needs to return here and I want to talk about that because when we look out there at day 10 you see that the atmosphere has got that ridge still in place but it's no longer here. It's pushed it over to the west and as I play this out you see that that ridge wants to stay there. So you end up getting flow that does that and runs over this. And what the, what the purpose of this is to tell you is that this returns moisture to the west. This excites systems from the southern plains all the way to the northern plains. And they just run over this ridge that's in the southeast. And that's the ridge that opens up the gulf. You put all that together. Let me just do that for you. You end up getting this pattern. This continues to show less and less of a dry bias. That's good. And this area you know, goes over wet. Unfortunately, this is an area that doesn't need more precipitation. 
So this pattern is going to stay quite active as we get into the month of March. Now take a look at these temperatures. I told you earlier, uh, you know, the temperature fluctuations were going to be quite large. Now here's where this was Thursday's temperature, excuse me. Friday, the last holdout for the warmer air is here in the Carolinas. And then watch what happens over the weekend. By Saturday into Sunday and Monday, look at the warm-up happening here. The cold air moves east, but it doesn't stick around there long. There's Tuesday into Wednesday. Now, the warm-up that we're having here is going to last for a little while, okay? Let's shrink this up and go take a look at day 5 through 10. You see that, that warm, those warmer conditions are there for a bit, but the quicker that ridge goes this direction, the more that flow pattern does this. And what I'm trying to show you here is that the day 10 through 15 reintroduces that cold air. Now, here's what I have to say about this pattern. I think it's going to remain quite volatile through the month of March. I do not think we'll settle into cold air. I think it's going to flip-flop considerably given the fluctuations we're seeing in the Pacific Ocean. So let's keep an eye out on that and watch it together. All right. Really appreciate your attention today. We will talk again on Monday. Thanks.